Okay, okay. Uh, so let's start. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone who is here. Um, welcome to another seminar. Today we, we have uh, Dorm Mincer of uh, MIT, and he will talk uh, about an invariance principle for the multi-slice, and hopefully we will learn some applications as well. Thank you very much, Jacob, and thank you everybody who has come. So indeed, I'm going to tell you about an invariance principle for the multi-slice and discuss some applications of it. So before we get into anything in the title, let me tell you what is invariance, or one example of invariance. So example. So this example, I hope that uh, we're all familiar with it. This is the central limit theorem. So this says the following. So suppose we have x1 to xn random variables that are independent. They have mean zero, variance one, and you need some more conditions. So I'll call it reasonable. Like uh, the third moment does not explode or some, something like that. Then in that case, if I take the sum of these random variables and divide it by the standard deviation of the sum, then I get a random variable that is uh, behaving very similarly to a standard Gaussian. So this is the standard center limit theorem. So why am I claiming that this is an invariance principle? Well, so another way to state this theorem is to say, okay, I know that uh, Gaussian, I can write it as a sum of Gaussians, independent ones, divided by the standard deviation. So D1 to GN are uh, IRD Gaussians. So in other words, now there is some uh, syntactic uh, meaning to this. It means that if I look at this polynomial, P of Z1 to Zn, which sums up its inputs and divide by square root of n, then the value distribution of this polynomial does not really depend on the input distribution that we plug into it. As long as the input distribution consists of independent random variables with the same mean and variance, then the value distribution is kind of the same. So the value distribution of P Z1 to Zn is invariant under the input distribution. Again, as long as you are you have independence, uh, mean zero, let's say, and variance one. Okay, so so this is a very kind of suggestive way to write this uh, claim that we all uh, know and love, the central limit theorem. And uh, it turns out that uh, this, or rather generalizations of it, is something that is very important in uh, PCP and in general in TCS. And this is something that I'm going to tell you about next. So, So back in 2005, there was this uh, very interesting paper of Kurt, uh, 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 Kindler, uh, Mosel, and uh, O'Donnell that showed a reduction from Unigames to MaxCut. And that paper, um, roughly speaking, showed that if you are willing to assume this Unigames conjecture, then the gomez williamson algorithm for MaxCut is optimal except that they couldn't quite prove it. They had some 
an analytical conjecture. And in order to prove this conjecture, this invariance principle that I'm going to tell you about now uh, was developed. So what is this invariance principle saying? This is the following theorem. So recall that earlier, we had this polynomial, p of z1 to zn, which was of very special form. And now we're going to say that the sta same statement holds for more general class of polynomials. So theorem, suppose we have a polynomial, p of z1 to zn, which takes the form so it's summation over some variables, but this set of variables is never too large. This is at most D, you can think of D as constant. A S times the monomial S. So, so far this is a general low degree polynomial. And we want to say that if we plug in random variables to this polynomial, the value distribution is invariant, whether we plug into it plus minus ones or Gaussians. But if you think about it for a moment, you can see that, for example, if you take this polynomial to be just the first coordinate, then uh, this is a bad example. This is not an invariant polynomial in this sense. So you need to say that no coordinate appears in too many of the monomials. Like it's, it, this polynomial is not a single coordinate or something like that. So this is a technical condition. It's called uh, with low influences. So you can think about it as no variables appear in too many of the monomials, but uh, formally speaking, what you say is that if you sum up the square of all of the monomials that contain some variable i, then this is never too large. But really, you can just think about it that the polynomial is kind of well spread around its variables. Then, invariance holds. Uh, that is, for example, if you plug into it random plus minus ones, the value distribution is very similar to if you plug into it Gaussians. Okay. So this is the invariance principle of, uh, uh, yeah, I should have given a citation of more. And yeah, so as I said, uh, the motivation to prove this invariance principle was to prove this reduction between unique games and max cut. But after this uh, result has been proven, it, it was used to prove many, many other things. So uh, this includes results in TCS, one very prominent one by Prasad Gavendra that I'm going to mention next, but also outside TCS. For example, you can use this type of machinery to prove a lot of results in extremal combinatorics. Um, so yeah, so it would be fair to say that this is a very important tool. So this has many applications. And one prominent one is Ragavento's theorem. That I'm going to explain next. So, uh, so this is a CSP seminar, so I assume that uh, most of the audience is familiar with uh, what this theorem says, but nevertheless, I'm going to say what it is, hopefully without making any mistake, but if I do, please <laughs> correct me. So this result says, okay, suppose that I have some constraint satisfaction problem. So suppose I have some predicate.
And now we consider the constraint satisfaction, the constraint satisfaction problem defined using P. Namely, I have a set of variables. Uh, let's not call it X, let's call it something else. Uh, A1 to AN, A variables. And then I have a bunch of constraints of the form P of AI, AI1, AIK. And I want it to be equal to one. So this is what an instance of CSP P is. So this is an instance, let's call it five. Now I have this instance, and suppose that I give you this instance and I tell you that this instance is 99% satisfiable. But I don't tell you, of course, the solution. How well can you perform efficiently? And what sort of hardness result can you pull forward? So a few of them. So this result says that once I fix this P and I fix epsilon greater than zero. So if I give you an instance of CSPP, so if I promise to you that it is 99% satisfiable, Then, okay, uh, then there exists some S, which is a number. Then I, if I give you this instance, then maybe you cannot do 99%, but you can do at least S fraction of the constraints. And what's more remarkable is that this is not some uh, super duper uh, algorithm. This is something very simple. This is achieved by a semi-definite program. So that's the first part. So you can do at least S using an SDP program. And secondly, you cannot do better than S. And of course, we have this uh, asterisk here, which is assuming the Unigames conjecture. So I'm not going to explain what UGC is in, in this talk, but uh, this is, uh, you can assume that it's true. So you can uh, eliminate this line if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a very kind of nice uh, dichotomy result because it says that you can do S, but you cannot do better than it. So, you know, you this result really nails down the complexity of approximation for all C, P, S, P. But it does so only when the promise is that you are 99% satisfied. And the main question that motivated, uh, or one of the questions that motivated our current work was trying to extend this result to the regime where I promise to you that the instance is fully satisfied. So what happens? for epsilon equals zero. So I'm going to refer to this as a perfect completeness.
Okay. So at first sight, this may seem to be okay. So this is a kind of the same problem with different parameters. Who cares? Nothing interesting happens. Um, but no. So there are some problems with complexity that is uh, very sharply between the case that epsilon is equal to zero and epsilon, which is very, very small, but not equal to zero. So there are CSPs. Uh, with complexity changes dramatically. For example, this uh, linearity CSP, which you can think of from F2 to the 3 to 0, 1. And uh, the output on x, y, z is 1. If and only if x plus y plus z is 0 modulo 2. So you can observe that if I give you a system of such equations, then you can do what we learned in the bachelors, you can do Gaussian elimination and indeed find a satisfying assignment. But if I don't promise you that it's fully satisfiable, if it's only 99% satisfiable, then you're in very bad shape. You cannot do anything non-trivial. Okay. So, so now we can ask ourselves, okay, so we have this very nice result of uh, Raghavendra and uh, it doesn't work for epsilon equals zero. So why is that? Is it because the statement is false? So first of all, the statement is false because uh, when you look at this uh, linearity uh, predicate, there are integrality gaps for STP algorithms and actually for some of squares algorithms that show that uh, they cannot do linear algebra. So the statement is certainly false. But then you can start asking yourself, okay, so so what happens? How how do we try to prove some analog of this theorem for satisfiable assignments? So uh, there are several uh, obstacles, let's call it, for proving a governor. Type theorem for perfect openings. So one of them is uh, what I promised not to talk about. The reduction starts from UGC. And this is a, a problem that inherently has imperfect completeness. So as long as you follow the things that people have been doing for 20, 30 years, there is no chance that you will end up with something with perfect completeness. So you need to do something else. Secondly, all of these analytical techniques that were employed in the proof of fundamental theorem, they really use the fact that you can apply some extra noise and you can smoothen things out because it only adds a little bit of to the epsilon. So, and more generally, this whole. Uh, uh, paradigm wherein, first of all, you construct a dictatorship test and then you transform it to another harmless result. This is also relies heavily on being able to apply noise on some functions. So, so really there are several obstacles that, uh, oh, third of all, so what is even the statement? So, yeah, so there, these are three obstacles. So, 
I'm going to tell you that there is indeed a substitute for UGC, which we do not know to be hard, of course, but it seems reasonable to be hard, which has better completeness. So this is uh, something which is called rich two to one games. So I don't want to elaborate on it too much. So I don't want to define it in particular, but this is something that is stronger than UGC, but at the same time, it's a bit trickier to work with. So you cannot take all of the analytical machinery that exists over product spaces and apply it as is. So you need to do some adjustments. And it turns out that something that is uh, some domain that replaces all of these hypercubes that is convenient to work with is the multi slice, which takes me to the topic of the current talk. Yeah, so I'm next going to define this multi slice business. But let me, before I define it, let me tell you uh, why and what do we do. So the why is this multi slice is a good replacement for product spaces once you work with this rich two to one games conjecture. So if you're willing to take it, then it works very nicely. But then all of the analytical machinery that exists over product spaces does not carry over automatically. And what we do in this work is we show that indeed you can recover in the sense that you need some uh, new techniques in order to do it, but you can recover some classical results from product spaces and indeed prove some sort of invariance principle between this multi slice and product spaces. And this way you can indeed extend some of these uh, uh, elements to work with rich to one games and in particular we get some harness results using uh, this connection. So if there are no questions, let me uh, next define what the multi slice is and tell you a bit more of what we do in this work. So before I tell you about the multi slice and all of this, so let me just mention that this general question of obtaining uh, analog of the Venter theorem for epsilon equals zero. So this is kind of a, a very big problem because in particular it includes in it the dichotomy conjecture, which was just proven a couple of years ago that distinguishes between satisfiable and not satisfiable. And here the task is, satisfiable and what can you do approximation wise? So, so we are far from solving it completely, but this sort of uh, motivates us to consider this element that I'm going to talk about next. Okay, so what is the Moody slice? So we have a parameter M so this you should think of the alphabet size, kind of the alphabet size of your CSP. So in particular, you should think of it as a constant. Let's say M, M equals two or three, this will do. Then we have N. This is very loud. And then we have M numbers, K0 to K M minus one. So this is a vector of numbers and these sum up to N. So now the multi slice with this vector K of dimension N is the set of all strings in M to the N so if I finished here, this will be a product space, but you need, to you need to satisfy some budget conditions. So for every alphabet element, for every B in M, the number of coordinates in X 
that are equal to this B is exactly K sub B. So, so this is the moving slice. So uh, for uh, our work and for this talk, uh, the k, the vector k that we consider has to be at least somewhat balanced. So for us, we will need k sub b to not be too close to n and not too close to zero. And really, that nothing really changes if you change it uh, within this range. So let's just say that k sub b, they're all the same and they're all equal to n over m. It wouldn't change anything really. So this is the multi slice. And the rough question that to ask ourselves is how different is the multi slice from m to the n? I'm sorry, Dor. Can I ask a question? Is this uh, yes. k zero or k i? Because uh, it's uh, the index uh, looks a lot like zero, but it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So k b is equal to n over m for all b. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, and in in the definition, um, it's also some k b, right? Yeah, it's k sub b. So uh, okay, <laughs> yes, sorry. So the question is, how different are the multi slices with the uniform distribution? And M to the N with the uniform distribution. You know, so on the one hand, of course, these two spaces are completely different, right? One of them is kind of flat and the other one is kind of large. They're not closed in total variation distance or anything like that. But in another sense, if we sample an X according to the uniform distribution in M to the N, then we do know that the number of I is such that, let's say X I is equal to I don't know, zero would indeed be n over m up to some little bit of error. So on the one hand, they're completely different. On the other hand, they seem similar. So what can you prove? What can you say about the similarity? So is there an invariance? And principle between the two. So what do you mean by that? I mean that suppose that I give you a function over the multi slice. Can you find a function over the product space? Such that the value distribution of fx is similar to the value distribution of f tilde. So here, x is uniform over the multi slice. And Z is uniform over M to the N. So this is what I mean by an invariance principle. So this sort of question has uh, been considered uh, previously by these two works, uh, FKMW, and FM. 
So they did consider this question, but only in the case that M is equal to two. So this is known as the slice. And what this work showed is that indeed you have invariance principle. As long as your function is not too high degree. So not too high here is little of squared of n. And so this is a very nice result and it's kind of tight. And uh, what's not so nice about this works is that the techniques are very, very specialized to the case that M is equal to two. So roughly speaking, what they do is they look at the space of functions, real valued function over the Moody slice. And this is not a product space. So you don't have the nice basis of uh, characters that we all know and love. So instead they come up with some different bases, which is not too bad, which, we, which you can still make some computations work. And then using this basis, they construct this function F field, which comes out very naturally. And then they work very hard to prove that the value distributions is similar. But all of this is very tailored for M is equal to two. And once you go, try to go to M equal to three or four, it may be possible, I don't know. But uh, it certainly will get a lot messier because you need to find the basis and make all of these things work. So this is not what we do, this work. So, so in this work, uh, we show that actually this theorem holds for every constant m. And in fact, we do not use any explicit basis for functions. Instead, we appeal to symmetry based arguments that uh, maybe I'll say a few words about. So here's what we prove. So this is the basic version of our invariance principle. So we show that if you have a function on the Moody slice of the great most n, sorry, most power of n, And so now, now I, I want to formalize this notion of being close uh, a bit more uh, delicately. So suppose they have this function. And then I can find a coupling between those two spaces. So here by coupling, I mean, this is a joint distribution of two random variables where marginally X is uniform over the multi-slice and Z is uniform over M to them. And I can find a function F till over M to them such that FX is close to F till of Z. So on average, when I sample XZ according to this coupling, and I look at the different squared. This is very, very small. Okay. So, uh, so there are additional properties of this F field that we do need for our applications, but this is sort of the, the main one. And I also want to say that this function F field, it's actually very natural. It's not something that comes out of, you know, thin air. So what would be the first attempt for F field? Well, so we already said that, okay, we want to evaluate F field at X. So we know that X is close to the Moody slice in the sense that we are only square root of n off in each alphabet symbol. So we can try to define fx to be f of x to be f of z, where 
z is the closest point in the multi slice. So intuitively, this seems right because the distance, the Hamming distance between x and z is at most root n, the degree is at most root n, so maybe it works. And this is a bit too brutal. And this does not work in general, but something very similar to that works. So what does work is you take some sort of average over the points that are close to x. So what does work is to evaluate f tilt x, you do a sampling according to the coupling that the theorem promises you of fz, condition on x being x. So, so this is really a very natural uh, function to try, and indeed we show that this works. But in order to show that this works, we cannot use any of the standard for analysis machinery because this is again not a product space. Uh, so instead we managed to convert, so this is not hard, we convert this problem into some problem of eigenvalues of some operator. And we use the symmetries of the multi slice, and in particular the fact that Sn acts on it in order to uh, calculate its eigenvalues. So maybe I'll say a few more, more later, but let me just say that the analysis uh, uses uh, the symmetries. Of uh, the multi slice uh, under the action of Fessen. And in particular, some basic representation theory of Fessen. Uh, yeah. So as stated, this theorem uh, only works for low degree polynomials, but you can actually extend it beyond that. You can prove it for functions that look like low degree polynomials in the sense that they have small mass uh, on the high degrees and also a bit beyond that, but uh, I don't want to state it because it's a bit too technical. And yeah, so let me mention two uh, concrete applications for CSPs that we have for this invariance principle. Um, so what we do here is, uh, so as I said, there is this connection between dictatorship tests and uh, harness of approximation results. And what we do here is we show that indeed you can use this multi-slice business in order to carry several dictatorship tests into harness results. So I'll tell you about two of them. So the first one is about the largest gap a CSP can have. So it says that uh, assuming uh, this uh, substitute for UGC, there exists uh, an infinite number of uh, Rs. So it's nothing mysterious. Uh, it just uh, like powers of two of powers of two minus one, but I don't want to write it. And for each one of these Rs, you have a CSPPR. So 
such that uh, for every epsilon greater than zero, given an instance of CSP PR, uh, it's NP hard to distinguish between, first of all, the case where the instance is fully satisfiable. And secondly, the case where it's very not satisfiable. So the value of psi is at most. I think what you get is 2r plus 1 over 2 to the r plus epsilon. So, uh, so here the problem is uh, what is the largest gap that you can get between uh, this one and this guy? So, right, because the CSP has two to the R inputs and at least one of them is accepting, the very worst you can do is one versus one over two to the R. Uh, so, we of course don't want to know how to get that. But what we can show is that uh, assuming this two to one games thing, we can get this gap. Which is the best that, uh, that is known. And the second color is uh, about coloring. So it says again that assuming this reached to one business. Uh, for all delta greater than zero, if I give you a graph G, it's NP hard to distinguish in the cases uh, that first of all G is three global. Secondly, that G does not even have independence of size delta. Yeah, so. Unconditionally, we don't know much about coloring. So I think that the best that we know is that if you are, that is NPR to distinguish between a graph that is three colorable and a graph that is uh, five or six. I don't remember the exact number, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, this is a very hard problem. Uh, but if, if you're willing to assume this, uh, uh, conjecture, then our understanding is much better. So, any questions about it? Uh, I assume, just a quick technical question, uh, I assume you mean density of delta in this independent set? Or... Yeah, fractional size. Uh... Oh, fractional size. Yeah. 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 Uh... Okay, uh, thanks for a really nice talk. Um, are there any questions? So, yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, what is this um, coupling between uh, in the invariant theorem? Is it some natural natural coupling on could come yeah. up? Yeah. So it's something very natural. So so what you can do is you can you can sample statistics of something that sample according to M to the N. Thank you. 
and then for each symbol you choose so if you if you chose less than n over m you can keep it as as that so so right so you can sample statistics let's say that uh, it says that we have l01 l00 up to l a minus one a coordinate equal to l a minus one then you take the minimum between l i and k i and sample this jointly so so right so we have x which is uh, in the Mully slice and then we have z so um for the okay so let's say that l0 is smaller than k0 then you pick a subset of size l0 and you put zeros in both x and z so you do that if l0 is larger than k0 you just say okay i pick n over m so this gives you almost all of uh, all of x and then you need to fill up the the gaps and this would just be square root of n coordinates in which they differ so what you arrange is that x and z they agree on almost all of the coordinates except on one over square root of n fraction in expectation okay. yeah Once. Another question? Maybe I will have one in the meantime. Uh, I remember that there was there was some trouble with like approximate approximation hardness of uh, not all equal. Can you can you actually provide uh, some good result for that? Yes, actually, yeah. that's a good question. So I don't know. Uh, so is the issue there is that there is no dictatorship test, right? Uh, I think that there is a dictatorship test that that is pretty good, that is as mm -hmm. good as, as it's supposed to be, but uh, nobody is, was able to actually turn it into. I see. Yeah. So that, that so I wasn't actually aware of this. So that would be a good. Uh, uh, it, it may be the case that you can convert it into a hardness result using this tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So somehow, in my mind, if you pretend that unique games has perfect completeness, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you can make the reduction work. Then you would be able to use these things in order to make the reduction work. Also. But of course, this is all, all play pretend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you are essentially like saying that intuitively, if if you could pretend that unique games have perfect completeness, and your proof works with that, then it's very likely to work with your framework as well. Yeah, yeah, so that's exactly your point. Okay. Yeah, that, that's sort of the way we got to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thanks. Any more questions? Seems that there are none. So um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks again Dara, for a really cool talk. And thanks, uh, thank all of you for coming. And I think we will see each other in a month. Should I stop recording now? Uh, you can stop recording, yes. Absolutely.